This is the Watchmen podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we're here talking about feedback for episode eight, A God Walks Into a Bar. Welcome back, fellow watchers. This is the eighth bulletin of our Atomic Watchers, otherwise known as the feedback for episode eight of The Watchman. A God Walks Into a Bar. I am one of your hosts, Derek. Hi there, fellow watchers. I am one of your other hosts, John. Welcome back. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Chris is still uh, has still disappeared, uh, a bit like Looking Glass. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, he's nowhere to be found. <laughs> um, I can categorically say no dead bodies in a sort of... Uh, secret, fairly um, sort of suspicious-looking underground bunker. Well, we haven't checked all of his suspicious-looking bunkers, but we do know he's in LA at the moment because we've been talking to him. So, so we know where he is. <laughs> yes, exactly. But I'm not going to vouch for him just yet. <laughs> but we are in that sort of existential moment where we actually have feedback from him. Yes, we do. Yes, we're going to kick off our feedback episode with some thoughts from Chris about episode eight of. Watchmen. Yeah, so we're going to kick off with Chris's thoughts since he's in LA and missed the episode, uh, our, our podcast discussion of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he sent it through on our Facebook group. So uh, yes, remember you can head on over to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash TV podcast industries. Another big shout out to all the newcomers who have arrived in the last few weeks as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, Chris says... A bit late this week, but getting my feedback in this week from sunny LA. First up, wow. I really enjoyed the flashback version style used. (laughs) Interesting. We thought he wouldn't. But it wasn't actually a flashback episode. Mm -hmm. Yes. But Chris continues, as someone who last week was against the use of flashback, I was so happy how they explained it. Mm -hmm. There is no flashback and no flash forward. Everything is happening at the same time. Very, very clever. Nice. That shootout scene brought the right amount of action to a very story-heavy episode, and the ending. Dr. Manhattan and his actions were so perfect. The character actions were in line with how he would have acted as a logical god versus a human running on emotions. Mm -hmm. It's not that he didn't want to stop things. It's because he sees things as having already happened and believes he can't change it. I also nearly missed that post-credit, but my god, it was epic. The closing (laughs) manic laughter was fantastic. More thoughts to come next week in the finale. Yes, Chris will be with us for the finale. Better be. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, definitely. I hope everyone picked up on the Mm post-credit scene, because if you didn't get literally to probably the last 10 or 15 seconds of the um, end credits of that episode, then you missed a whole um, post-credit sequence in the bubble on Europa, uh, one of the moons of Jupiter, mm-hmm. with uh, Ozymandias and his Miss Crookshanks and Mr. Phillips uh, all around him. Yes. Uh, yes, a lot of tomato pummeling going on in there. Definitely, and I'm going to actually call him out as a separate character now. The gameskeeper seems to be the first Mr. Phillips and seems to be a completely separate character from all of the rest of them, I think. Given that in this episode, as we mentioned on our podcast, he particularly seems to challenge Adrian Veidt as well in this scene. So he seems to be a very different version of Mr. Phillips uh, that we've seen throughout the show. So I think he's a separate character and I think it's a really, really important scene uh, because effectively I think it's leading to Adrian Veidt escaping his uh, imprisonment in Europa. Even though it's not an imprisonment, he wanted to go there in the first place. It's just not the paradise he thought it was going to be. (laughs) It's interesting, isn't it? Because I wonder, is he so different from the newer versions of himself? Mm. Is it just simply a matter of having experienced that paradise or, or that life for him longer than the others? Is it simply that or... I'm just wondering, if you had Dr. Manhattan as your god who lived among you, and then he was replaced with Ozymandias, Adrian Veidt, who then, on his first firing out to space, was Miss Crookshanks, when there were only two of them. Mm -hmm. 
he had to pick one. He picks Miss Crookshanks to test the suit out or fire off it through the dome to test some of his theories. Then maybe that's why he kind of kept himself and maybe reneged against um adrian veidt maybe maybe he is ultra polite still very got that definitely british uh sense of politeness to uh to adrian veidt still and he's still very welcoming but i wonder if it's just this idea of adrian veidt assumes that, that these creatures that are being created on the planet don't have feelings because they don't complain very much and what actually this character the gameskeeper is saying is i've been here long enough i saw the god build the planet and he left us behind and he stepped into a leadership role effectively. So he's actually has evolved in some sense over the time that he's been on the planet, maybe over those 20, 30 years that he's been there, yeah. uh, that he's evolved into a new character. But uh, great thoughts though, Chris. Um, I know, I'm really glad you enjoyed the episode because we were joking, as we said on the last episode, that you didn't want a flashback episode this time. And it ended off being no flashbacks, um, just everything happening at the same time for uh, for Doctor Manhattan. So a nice little way of uh, of doing something very different. <laughs> yeah, and and it's interesting um, that you say he and he believes he can't change it because I suppose I wonder if this is kind of relating to gods in general in that they put down a series of you know if you believe in God, there's this universe that's created with laws and and so on then he would have to intervene to actually reverse those laws. Mm. So it's not that he can't change it, but he risks causing chaos and catastrophe if he does. You're, that's what you think as well? No, I'm just postulating right. a, a theory here. Okay, okay, because the way I've always taken Dr. Manhattan's power is that everything's happening at the same time, as in it's happened. So everything, even in the future, has already happened to him. So he can't change anything because it's happened. And the reason why he reacts differently to things and the reason, you know, things like Angela looking at him while something's happening and he's explaining to her, no, no, this is how it happened. The reason he's able to do that is because that won't affect the outcome. If he tried to do anything to affect the outcome, he would have already done that because it happened. No, but I think that's a God thing. Mm. It's when people say, well, why doesn't God stop x y or z yeah and it's because he just doesn't so i i don't believe in an entity mm -hmm. not having the power to change something if potentially it's worse off i mean there's always going to be bad things happen yeah um that's the probability of life and maybe that's how he is interpreting it or maybe it's just that he just simply is not going to do all that thing because he has set in in motion mm. the mechanisms of life and that's how they go right right um so i, I yes i think he can experience this that and the other but he can move back and forth mm-hmm through that yeah absolutely i think i think it kind of uh, to take a very simplistic example in comic books there's a character Wa watu and the watchers who watch over everything in the marvel universe and that's all they're supposed to do is just watch it and let it happen because they're not supposed to intervene dr manhattan is slightly different in that in that he's never been able to intervene it's kind of the problem with omniscience i suppose would be the the, the way that you describe it he can't intervene because it's already happened um, there's no way of stopping the flow of time uh, because it's all happening to him at the same time but he can experience he can stop and pause and take notes of what's happening for his own benefit but he's or to tell other people what's going to happen to them in the future but it's going to happen that's yeah. why he's not able to stop but arguments and that kind of no, thing. no exactly but i mean he does talk about setting in train a sequence of events as well mm -hmm. by going to see angela's grandfather mm -hmm. so the idea that things are inevitable or not because he sets in train that with his meeting but you know he says that and that's a very different thing from him saying i now know that he ends up there mm -hmm. he sets in train and i think that's a different premise to it than simply saying as he does with angela a lot um you're going to tell me this or when she goes how do i know this mm -hmm. because you told me well, when do I tell you? It's got 30 minutes, but I'm not going to tell you how. Yeah. And it's also a very different power relationship in a temporal sense mm -hmm. if he is a god because he is able to 
move through and around and within time but to experience it at the same time yes yes he's able to experience it all exactly i think i think the one thing that we've got to remember is that people christened him a god because of the power set that he has he's not a god he's developed into that he has now created life on another planet all that kind of stuff definitely and um, but he still has a set of powers like you would have in comic books there are a set of things that he can and a set of things that he can't do one of the things he can't do is change the future because he's experiencing he can't change the past because it's already happened and he can't change the future because it's already happened to him as well, well then so, if he's not yeah. a god then he can talk about individual agency to mm-hmm. shift things yeah and actually he could not have intervened then yeah he can't intervene in anything but he knows what he has to do to achieve what's already happened so yeah. he knows he had to kill all six of those cavalry members that that died on the battlefield there but, but he knew that there was one more left because he'd already seen the future and knew what was going to happen but that's not inevitable because he chooses to leave the house because if he didn't he wouldn't have been on the battlefield and of course angela would have died mm-hmm. Yeah, and that would have changed stuff. So but he didn't choose to leave the house. He had already left the house in the future and killed those people. So that was his moment to leave. Otherwise, he would have just left before Angela or wouldn't have gone to make pancakes, for example. He would have just gone out and killed the cavalry. They were already there. He did it at the moment he was supposed to because it already happened. Uh, it's a really interesting concept. And I know it's it's really annoyed a lot of people over the last week trying to get their head around it because they're all kind of going, oh, why is he dead, for example? Which he isn't dead. He's just leading to his future that he's been taken away. They're wondering why he didn't stop it earlier. They're wondering why he didn't kill the last cavalry guy since he knew he was behind him. He didn't do any of those things because it had already happened in this way before. But he doesn't like telling other people around him because they get really angry at him for for telling him the future. He still, says specifically Angela doesn't like him telling her what she's going to say or going to do. So he's refrained from doing that for many years. No, I mean, I, I get that he experiences time all at, all at the same time. Mm-hmm. But I still don't believe what I'm talking about is not so much that I'm talking about fate and destiny. Okay. And that's what he's saying is that I am powerless to do any and to change it. And that's what he constantly tells Angela. Mm. And I think there are moments here where it's clear he can. But that's just how it rolls. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a story where he's just been zapped by a tracking beam. But he knows that has to happen, and he knows he's not dead. He also knows his end as well. He knows everybody's end because he's seen everything. He knows when everybody dies. Um, So he can't stop that. And God is a superhero, (laughs) technically, because his superhero ability is he can create life like Dr. Manhattan has done. I think it's more about sacrifice, potentially. It's like Jesus going up on the cross or something. Like, what I'm saying is there is a significant amount of religious um iconography oh yeah and religious um sort of beats here Mm -hmm. even though he proclaims himself to be a scientist um that and now maybe they are two religions in their own right but anyway i think well uh, there are thousands of religions and thousands of gods and i think there are obvious metaphors in here for humans' belief in God and what they thought when they saw Dr. Manhattan and saw his powers was that he replaced God for some people. Uh, as we talked about earlier on in the season, uh, the concept changed for people when Dr. Manhattan walked into the, walked into the world and had these abilities effectively. Um, but certainly the, the comic book originally and the show now is saying there are different things that are perceived about this character that may not be accurate to who he is. And everybody's perspective on the character does frame their opinion about him. Like, for for instance, the Vietnamese absolutely hate him because he effectively beat their country with a click of his fingers and made it part of the US. So they absolutely despise Dr. Manhattan. He's not a god to them. He is their, exactly. he is their killer. He is the person that subsumed them into the US. So I think probably string theory would be able to explain this, except... I don't know enough about string theory. <laughs> I don't even know which string theory you're, th- you're talking about, John. <laughs> it was kind of tried to be portrayed at the end of Interstellar. Okay. But anyway. But that was time travel, and that was changing well, of time. There's different realities, actually. Yeah, which is, which multiple is changing. Multiple universes, multiple timelines. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Dr. Man- Dr. Manhattan's 
Bill Letty is seeing the one timeline from start to end. A single one. Yeah. 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 And he doesn't believe in other reality. Yeah, exactly. A a true god would be able to go through multiple universe Mm -hmm. timelines of everyone. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. Okay. So I think, yes, Dr. Manhattan is useless. He (laughs) should be able to see everything happening and experience time in multiple universes for everyone. That'd be even worse than experiencing just one timeline well, over and over again. <laughs> but I think that's also, again, one of the Alan Moore little quirks and tricks of the Watchmen is saying, if somebody wants to be omniscient, this is the problem with omniscience. All you can do is see what's going on and not change it. Oh, that's not what you wanted. It's kind of like the the old thing of the monkey's paw. You know, you get your wish. You're able to see everything that's going on, but you can't stop your, your family from dying. Oh, sorry. Did I not tell you that was a problem of being omniscient? Yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. Anyway, this is our feedback episode. So we're going to get on some feedback from uh, some other members of our Watchers group. Yes, we got a few thoughts from Chris Harry by email. Uh, just to remind all our fellow Watchers, you can send in your thoughts by email to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. But Chris, aka another Chris, <laughs> uh, says, Hi guys, uh, loving the podcast. After the actual show itself, it's something I look forward to every week. Well, thanks, Chris. That's really nice. Uh, really nice. Thanks, Chris. Um, hopefully we bring a, a little bit of seasoning to the, the episodes yeah. of, of Watchmen. Um, Chris continues, I couldn't help but think if there's any connection between Calvin's name and John Calvin, the 16th century theologian, heretic in the eyes of the Catholic Church, in particular the doctrine of predestination that usually gets ascribed to Calvinism, the belief, and I'm simplifying here, that one is predestined to achieve salvation or damnation, and there's nothing you can do to change that path. Mm -hmm. Not unlike Dr. Manhattan, who has a predestiny of his own that even an omnipotent being can't avoid. Just a thought. Can't wait for episode nine, Chris. Thank you so much, Chris. I I think that's, that is one of those. It's probably slightly sort of controversial and, and divisive. This idea, you know, if you, if you grow it and it's not just about being saved or damned from a religious point of view but it's that idea if you 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 are born working class are you expected to stay as a working class person or can you move to middle class or you're a manual laborer uh you know you're brought up in that kind of family uh sort of as a, a miner a manufacturer a steel worker are you supposed to stay and not become maybe a solicitor or a um a, a banker or something non sort of uh manufacturing related and i i think um the the, the issue with predestiny is that it it does mean almost it will for me anyway it, it kind of links more to that that you're not able to burst out of your your bubble and i i find that a little limiting mm. um but certainly i would agree dr manhattan here has that very much um predestined view of what is to come and what he can or effectively if he holds that theory he won't do because he thinks that it's predestined Mm -hmm. Uh, and i think that's the it is it is a fairly uh, controversial thing and i would say not probably just with religion but potentially within society i think it comes with that idea of um biological determinism Mm -hmm. that nature versus nurture you know are your genetics programmed in a way that you will only die at 56 be, uh, from a heart attack because you're genetically uh, predisposed towards that or a healthy lifestyle from the get-go may extend you to 76 right. or chance or um you know those kind of things um or all you know murderers well they were genetically predisposed towards being killers in some way because of this that and the other and i mean yes for me it's always one or the other uh, a lot of that debate and for me it's very much well i think they both influence and factor into people's lives um and i i think um you know, I, I think it, it's an interesting thing and it's one that I would definitely agree with and that we see here with Dr. Manhattan is this predestination that you would have 
heard from Calvinists, definitely. Absolutely. And I think you're right, Chris. Yeah, it does. It does sound like the same kind of concept. And remember when Manhattan saw Cal and was given his name for the first time, he said, that's, I really agree with that name. I could live in this guy's body effectively. So uh, instantly when he heard the name, he went, oh, that sounds like something like me. We thought it was because Cal uh, translated into the English terminology uh, means bold one effectively, which is kind of a joke. But absolutely the second meaning of it being that it could be connected to Calvinism, um, which is similar to the beliefs of Dr. Manhattan. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it, with that line? Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Definitely. It be connected. Yeah. Um, one of the things to remember as well is as I mentioned earlier on, there is a difference between omniscience and omnipotence. Omniscience is knowing everything and omnipotence is the ability to be all powerful effectively. And Dr. Manhattan is omniscient. He knows what's going to happen, but he's not omnipotent. He can't do everything. He can do quite a lot of things as we've seen. He can create humans, he can create a planet, but he can't do everything he wants to do. He is omniscient, not omnipotent, as far as we know anyway, not according yeah, to the story. It's a little so. column A, column B. Um, he is not all powerful in the sense that tachyon particles do blind him. Mm -hmm. The, the trachean beam or tachyon beam, I should say, um, has obviously, you know, sucked him to um, another part of the the world, yeah, i.e. Exactly. Seventh Cavalry headquarters. Yeah, so we believe. Yeah. yeah, he he can't resist everything. Exactly, like exactly. chocolates. <laughs> no, that that'll be us, John. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> thanks so much again, Chris, for that email. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. Continuing on, another email in from Jimbo. He says, "Gents, based on my last few weeks' feedback, you may already know where I'm going to be going with this one. And for me, this was just one flashback episode in a, in a row too many. To be clear, it's not the flashbacks themselves." which without exception have all been fantastically written and directed. Can you actually class it as a flashback when it's basically half a series, but more Damon Lindelof's choice of narrative structure in using them so prolifically, or should that be excessively? This individual episode was as entertaining as always, in particularly the acting from Jeremy Irons and Regina King, who in my mind should be cleaning up at the Emmys for her performance as Angela. I just can't get over the pacing of the season. I appreciate it has all been meticulously mapped out, but like Azamandias' original master plan, it might just be a bit too complex and unusual for me, like having one too many fine ingredients in an otherwise exceptional dish. I also don't know why they did that last scene with Adrian that way. Nothing wrong with the content, although I would love to have seen him reading The Count of Monte Cristo, <laughs> but why post credits in episode eight of nine episodes? Very odd. But then again, we are talking about scenes taking place on a moon of Jupiter. Throw in what is effectively a bit of time travel with the whole chicken or egg situation, and you have something most of us know better than to try and think about too deeply for fear of brain meltdown over the different permutations. My main issue really is that we've seen so little of characters like Laurie, Looking Glass, and even Panda for about a month, let alone trying to follow what is going on with the underlying story. Maybe it will all come together in the finale, but particularly if season two is going to involve a brand new cast, it would be a real shame to have missed out on more time with these guys. I am aware that I might be in the minority here, though, having seen plenty of love for this love story online, and I am very pleased to hear the series has strong ratings on HBO. I know we're about positivity in the podcast, so I want to finish on a high. Back in my younger days of the late 90s, all I wanted to do was work in the movie business. This was my golden age of cinema, with well-made and interesting films like Fight Club, The Matrix, and Big Lebowski, and TV was just TV. Maybe I need to take my nostalgia pills, but I honestly think we are now at the point where TV is a stronger medium than film, and Watchmen is a real example of this. There has been plenty of coverage recently about the likes of Scorsese and Coppola and their thoughts on Marvel movies, but even Marty would have to admit that the themes, acting and score, especially the cinematography of shows like this and Game of Thrones, are far beyond what we have ever imagined would have been possible on a small screen back then. What a world we live in, and here's to a fantastic closing episode next week. Jimbo. Some excellent, excellent thoughts in there, Jimbo. While we may not agree about the idea of these flashbacks, I, I totally agree with a lot of what you've said here. Um, I, I get it, I suppose. You know, with a nine-episode show, a lot of people would be looking at it for the narrative to be driven forward in every single episode. What I would caution, though, is with this story, it is taking its cue from the Watchmen comic books always. Uh, they, they describe it in the writer's room. Uh, everybody that's been involved in the show that I've read interviews with described it as if the Watchmen comic book was the Bible that they went back to. It's what actually happened in their universe. They treated it like a history book and then everything else spun out of that. Every time something they were talking about, whether their cars, every car should be electric, they'd go back to the comic books and go, is there anything in the comic books that would inform how technology would have moved ahead? That's how they use them uh, as their basis. And very much, if you look at the comic books, it was a, a story mostly actually told through 
through the past and through what was going on back in the 50s and through what was going on with Dr. Manhattan growing up and arriving in the 80s, the actual 80s set storyline in 1985 was quite a small storyline. Um, it was kind of the end of the story as opposed to most of the chapters of the 12 issue book. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, do you know, I, I, I do agree with you, Jimbo, around the characters like Laurie looking glass um, and... Mm. Panda, and, and for me, I suppose I would add to that Agent PC. Yeah. Uh, and specifically, you know, I think what we can safely guess, although I'll probably be proven wrong in episode nine, um, his lube man, you know, his, his silver uh, spandex man. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, if we don't get the lube man back, that scene is just really, really weird. <laughs> um, and I, and I mean, actually to the point of being unnecessary, because I, I think, you know, if we don't get Agent PT, um, back, uh, or dare I say it, lube guy, um, <laughs> then, you know, that scene, uh, where Angela Abar is chasing him because he's just seen her, throw the the wheelchair into the back of the dumpster going to the landfill not none of it makes sense absolutely none of it really yeah. that whole chase scene or that character makes no sense because you might as well just have agent pc sort of with binoculars in up in a tree mm -hmm. on the other side of the road or in a car or in a building keeping tabs yeah. or a drone and uh, um, so i i really would like to to see Agent PC and, and Laurie Blake, because I think they have been amazing. I, I think Looking Glass 2, it would be great to see more of, but I do think his kind of shadowy existence is kind of represented quite nicely by him not being on screen mm. too much and, and having a, a, a much more of a sparse sort of, um, set of dialogue and, and, and screen time but i would still like to see more of him i would love to know more about red skirt to be honest mm -hmm. because again it, it is a shame we're not able to um i suppose round out those characters a bit more um but i think for me certainly uh laurie blake and agent pc and, and looking glass i i would agree with you there i think it is a shame that um in a sense the flashbacks have meant they maybe have been squeezed more but having said that the the flashbacks or not flashbacks um i think are, have been really uh really good so mm -hmm. I, I don't have any quibble with them at all yeah yeah i i, I know what you mean i don't think we're going to get a season two of the show now from some of the other things that have been said this week i don't think we're going to get a series two of the watchman particularly with these this set of characters and that does make some of the decisions made in this season kind of stand out, I suppose, as unique. You know, we got an entire episode that was a flashback telling us the backstory of Looking Glass, and then the episode ended with people coming to attack him, and then the next time we see his place, we see that he beat up the guys and got out. But that's all we know about him. Um, I am absolutely guaranteeing we're going to see the character back next episode. We haven't seen the next episode, obviously, but I'm guaranteeing we're going to see Looking Glass back next episode, and his backstory was important. I'm expecting that we're going to see lube guy as john's calling him or we're calling him here we're probably going to see him back next episode as well to close out the series because since the show is so meticulously put together there's no reason they'd put lube guy in that one moment in the episode and then have him disappear for the entire series and not have him back in the finale so i i would find it difficult criticizing the show for using their characters the way they've decided to use them it's an odd decision to make a show nine episodes long when the original comic was 12 episodes and then walk away from it. But they worked in this show for two years before it went into production. That's part of the reason why I don't think we're going to get a second season because they'd want to be already be working on it for the last two years to get it into production to, to come out next season uh, or next year. Um, but you're absolutely right. In terms of the type of storytelling we're getting on TV now, I think it's masterful. We're getting shows Definitely. we never would have yeah. gotten before. You know, they kicked off with things like Twin Peaks and kicked off with things like X-Files that started out being procedural shows and suddenly had a bigger narrative to tell. And they've only gotten better. There's so many shows that we've t talked about on the podcast and so many shows that we're seeing now coming up that have a much, much bigger scale to them. And if we're able to get series like this show, or True Detective, for example, or some of the seasons of American Horror Story as well, where you have one narrative that's really 
you have one narrative that's told on television as big a scale as you get in a movie, but just much longer, effectively, and t- filling in all the gaps and filling in loads of the details. And they do it in one season and then do something completely di- different next time. I'm all in. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and in terms of the Scorsese and Coppola comments, yes, there's been some interesting ones in there. Someone did point out the fact that Scorsese's attack on Marvel movies not being true cinema was also just around the time that his own movie that's going to Netflix was being released. So it could have just been a way to promote his movie that was in the cinema, saying, go see my movie, not, not those Marvel movies. So that makes a lot of sense. He was he was a producer on Joker, which is uh, also a, a, a DC Comics movie, effectively. So uh, he does have his own involvement in comic book movies. But um, I understand, you know, an old... An professional like himself who used to draw massive crowds to his movies they of course would be commenting on the mainstays of the box office going why don't you come see my movies people do people still love coppola i still love uh, scorsese and coppola movies absolutely love them really looking forward to seeing the irishman which just came out on, on netflix but times have changed people have have changed their habits in cinema Marvel movies basically are the new cowboy movies, the new westerns. You know, um, that's all they are. They're they're taking up space in the cinema, uh, bringing people out, and hopefully people will go out and see other movies as well as them. Well, yeah, I mean, people just need to get along. Marvel movies are Marvel movies. Scorsese movies are Scorsese movies, mm-hmm. and they're a very different breed. Um, that's not to downplay Marvel movies. Uh, it's just to say they are a different thing mm-hmm. entirely. Even within Marvel movies, they are different. I mean, I absolutely loved what the Russo brothers, ha- you know, did with Captain America, with Winter Soldier, mm-hmm. uh, and with um, Civil War, uh, and, and obviously with with Endgame uh, and so on. But you know, then you see Scott Derrickson doing um, Doctor Strange. He had one camera shots, you know, in, in that. The Russo brothers do a lot of cutting, do a lot of chopping uh, in terms of their direction. It's a very different style. Yeah. And so you have just differences, um, but that's just the way it is. And you have preferences for yeah. art forms. So There's room in the world for both, obviously. And as we see on TV, we're getting a lot more dramas going to TV, which is great, especially these kind of premium dramas. People are going to pay for them. I'm going to watch them on things like Disney Plus. I'm going to watch them on HBO and they're going to pay money to see good, fantastic TV dramas. Hopefully they keep making them. It's just a different place to see them, really. A lot of people don't have the opportunity to go out to the cinema and watch a, a, a very long movie that's only for adults that they can't bring their kids to, whereas Marvel movies they can bring their kids to. That's that's a family experience, right? So, of course, it's going to make a lot more money than a, than a three-hour gangster movie, um, which is only for over-18s, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, I totally understand it. In my day, a family experience was Jaws. Like, I was forced <laughs> to watch Jaws Good. or um, Nightmare on Elm Street, <laughs> yeah. those kind of things. So, yeah, I mean... Like, Kids need to watch horror. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. Thanks so much for that, Jimbo. Yeah, thanks, Jimbo. Uh, yeah, we also got uh, an email through from Benjamin Owsley. Benjamin says, hey, guys, another fantastic episode of Watchmen. I just have two small points this week. When I saw them smashing tomatoes in Vite's face, I remembered when he was on his horse in one of the earlier episodes and squeezed a tomato and threw it on the ground. Mm -hmm. Was he simply engineering the tomatoes for swishiness to be the best tomatoes for smashing into someone's face because he (laughs) knew this day would come, as seen in episode 8? I don't know about that, uh, Ben, to be honest. I think think um, (laughs) probably not. But, you know, it's it's one of those things where... um, it, I think it's more, this is just what was created by mm-hmm. Dr. Manhattan, but thank goodness they are swishy squishiness, um, because otherwise, he, yeah, the, the kind of bullet tomatoes that you get in the supermarkets <laughs> here, um, yep. Adrian Veidt would certainly, uh, have a lot of bruises. A lot of bruises. Yes, Maybe even a caved in cheekbone. Maybe. Um, I don't know, but certainly, yeah. Um, squishiness seemed to be Adrian Veidt's friend on that day um, because they really actually smashed it into his face. I mm-hmm. know one of the Miss Crookshanks one, like she did it and you watch it back and she's really just putting mm-hmm. her hand all over his face and uh-huh. sort of then swiping her hand down. It, it was really nicely acted in terms of the 
ver- verocity yeah. at which they were doing it. I thought it was pretty cool. I feel like the actors might have been having a lot of fun with that. Because remember, there's only three people <laughs> yeah, exactly. that have been working on that set for five weeks together. Nobody else is involved in other than those three actors. And I remember multiple, multiple takes to get all those Mr. Phillips and Miss Crookshanks, all of them in the background as well. So uh, so they must have just had a good laugh here, just smashing tomatoes into the face. I would say so. I, I wonder <laughs> if they had, you know, like if it was um, custard pies, you know, mm. did they just have a massive rotten tomato kind of uh, fight afterwards? Maybe. Maybe. Or, you know, like you would have a big snowball fight or something uh, <laughs> uh, once the camera or, or the director shouted cut. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, yeah, that that would be, I, I could see that happening actually. Yeah. Yeah. But as for whether they're engineered or not, you know, Adrian Veidt was the smartest man on earth and then sent off to Europe and he's the smartest man there now as well. Maybe he just predicted that this is what they would do if they caught him at some point or they just he just assumed this was the punishment he was going to get i think dr manhattan Mm. created them uh, when he created the life uh the on europa maybe but i like that he grew them on trees like apples exactly Uh, benjamin also says is it significant that john seems to be wearing the same suit when he first meets angela in the bar as when he meets up with Vite in Antarctica after him and Angela fight, mm-hmm. and she tells him to leave. Or just another example of how time doesn't work how we know it does with John Osterman. I don't think there's specifically any significance in the suit itself, but it is the same suit that he wears in the comic book all the time, the the white uh, shirt, uh, black suit. Um, he wears it He wears it uh, multiple times when he needs to be at events. He always puts on this particular suit. We've seen it many, many times. Um, when he was on television, that's the suit he'd wear, you know, that kind of stuff. So, uh, so I think it's just his go-to uh, suit that he creates. You know, he's seen it, he, he creates it and puts it on. Every time somebody looks at him and goes, could you put on some clothes, please? He ends off wearing this, uh, this lovely tailored suit, basically. So I think that's possibly just a callback to the comic books. I don't think there's anything specific. I don't think we see him in... Other than that end scene in the episode, he's wearing uh, Cal's clothes that he effectively wakes up in. I don't think we see him in any other clothes other than his underwear, basically. And and his birthday suit. The birthday suit, of yeah, course. That yes. is a form of clothes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Benjamin finishes with, thanks for everything. P.S. Was just reading about Tim Blake Nelson, and you know where he's from? Tulsa. Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good spot. That is a really good catch. I think we mentioned that on our preview podcast, but really good to call out. You know, I wonder if that moment where Tim Blake Nelson had to say that basically every white man in Tulsa is is racist. I wonder if that really rankled with him, being from that local area and being a white guy, having to say that everybody from there is racist. I wonder if that just kind of rankled with him having to say it or whether he just thought it was a, an interesting line to say. Well, I'm sure it would. I know if anyone ever talked about Ormskirk in that way, I would be <laughs> fairly rankled. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Thanks so much for that feedback, Benjamin. We also have some voicemail through from Steve Brown as well. So, fellow watchers, if you want to leave your dulcet tones over on our website for the discussion and feedback podcast, you can head on over to tvpodcastindustries.com and leave up to 90 seconds of your thoughts over on the voicemail uh, tab on the right-hand side of the website. Or you can send in an MP3 by Mm -hmm. email as well if you so want to. Yes. Absolutely. I love hearing from Steve Brown. It's really good that he does these voicemails for these episodes. He's he's been talking on his own podcast on on Panels to Pixels about Watchmen as well. Uh, And I know that he sends in his thoughts immediately after watching the episodes and then waits about three or four days, watches the episode a few more times, and then uh, does his podcast. So I'm glad we get his kind of first initial reactions to these episodes. And then last week, he sent us a feedback to us going, I don't care about anything else. All I want to know is about the love story between um, these two characters, between Angela and Cal. And this is what he got. So I'm really intrigued to hear his voicemail now. Take it away, Steve. Hey, guys, it's Steve. And uh, gosh, this episode is going to take several rewatches to to really adequately put into words all the things I, I think the, the writers and the directors did, director did a wonderful job of showing us on screen Dr. Manhattan's understanding of time and the whole thing of, I don't know what the concept of before means. I don't know what the concept of after means. And that whole, uh, period where he says there's a gap and he's got this gap in his memories that's obviously from the time that she puts the ring in his forehead to the moment she takes it out and so he doesn't have any of those memories 
but then just the way this story was retold was was really cool it was it was great to see Adrian Veidt to see how he ended up where he's at and uh and everything just uh a really really good episode but it's going to take several watches to really fully understand exactly uh all the the things the importance the ramifications of this episode and uh, I can't wait uh, to see how they're going to wrap it up how the finale is going to go one episode left um, to see where this all goes and I, I, I just can't wait uh, for that and uh, just so much uh, just amazing I can't wait to podcast about this episode I can't wait to watch it several more times uh, I, I can't wait to watch it on HBO Go because my DVR seemed to have some spots where it uh, digitized and where it uh, kind of blacked out. And I want to see if those are in the broadcast version or not. And I sent a, an email at the very beginning when I started watching the episode that even though IMDb shows a space between A and bar, it looked like to me when they showed the title on screen, there was no space between A and bar. So it's a God walks into a bar, not uh, a space bar. Anyway, uh, can't wait to hear what you guys thought. Talk to you later. Thanks, Steve, for that. I don't think he walked into a space bar either, <laughs> um, but certainly a bar and a bar. Yeah, I love that it, it could be it could be both. <laughs> it's really things. good, isn't it? And normally after the episodes come out, um, they they release that that snap of the title for the episode. Yeah, like last week behind the puppeteer, they had the name of the episode as he was puppeteering. This time they showed the clip for the episode where a god walks into a bar, and they had uh, Doctor Manhattan walking through the letters at the same time, so you actually couldn't make out the title. But definitely, if you pause it while it's on the screen, it is a bar. Uh, I love that there's just two meanings from it because it is that moment where the two of them meet. It may not be the moment where they both fell in love with each other, but it's the moment where they met for the first time. And I think it's really important to this entire series that the story is about a love story between these two characters and how much it affects the world if a woman like Angela falls in love with a god, you know? That's that's what I think is so interesting. She starts off and kicks off the whole thing by just having a guy walk into a bar when she's uh, reminiscing about her parents and, and drinking alone, you know? So uh, look how much has changed in the world because of that one little moment, you know? Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, couldn't agree with you uh, anymore, Steve, uh, just about how good and amazing uh, this show is. Mm -hmm. I, I've been bowled over by... Just the quality of it. it. It it almost to an extent reminds me of The Wire. I remember not thinking I would enjoy it. And I, again, this is something that either you maybe like or you dislike, mm -hmm. but I was fascinated from the get go with this portrayal of life in Baltimore, a city that I'd been to, but also, you know, the political community social structures which on the face of it shouldn't be compelling tv it doesn't sound it but i i found it fascinating um seeing those power plays and it, it i think this is almost like the comic version of it and you you see the the intricacies that uh, are trying to be explored here within this comic show around time around uh godliness around uh humanness around the best and worst traits of humanity around how you perceive and um, from which angle you see those best and worst traits of mm -hmm. humanity uh it, it's a really challenging bit of tv um you end off liking people you didn't think you would or you have realized that you're having the same opinion as people that maybe you didn't think you would ever have uh so it, it's really kind of fascinating yeah absolutely Stephen. and same john you know we we actually said when we sat down thinking about doing watchmen we weren't going to do it because we knew how difficult it was going to be to cover a show like this and one of the things i found really interesting in one of the reviews i, I heard this week um, one of the uh, people who was talking about this show said you've just done the worst thing you possibly could do on a tv show you've gotten to episode seven of the show and said, everything you thought you knew from the first episode is different. When Cal is revealed to be Dr. Manhattan, 
So effectively, everybody that's been watching this show episode by episode has to go all the way back to the start and go, what did I miss? <laughs> yeah. And that's what this show has done with this episode, with episode eight, as well as episode seven. Um, these two episodes particularly have said, I've pulled the rug out from under you and gone, well, maybe the narrator here isn't reliable. Maybe what you've been seeing all the way along isn't reliable. Maybe you need to go back to the start and watch it again. I'm really excited to watch it more. I love this episode. I've watched the episode three times now as well, uh, as, as usual. Really excited to see episode nine. But once this show is done and over, I will watch it again. And I think that's that's the best compliment I can give it. It's not a show that I'm going to put on the shelf and never watch again, because I really enjoyed spending time in this world and in this universe, much like the comic book. I have read that many times. And I certainly will watch this show a couple of times again, or many times again, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so really, really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for your voicemail. As always, Steve, hopefully we'll get a final one in for you for the finale. Yeah, thanks so much, Steve. We also got some more feedback through on our Facebook group. On our Episode 8 podcast, Mike Malone says, thank you for referencing the post credit scene at the top of this episode. <laughs> I started listening on my commute to work this morning. I paused the podcast, finished my drive, then watch the extra scene in my car in the parking lot. Now I can get back to your always excellent analysis and discussion. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. Our um, public service broadcast mm -hmm. did work uh, on that because, uh, yeah, I think yeah, not a lot of people expect the Marvel post credit scene uh, coming in a, first off, DC World mm -hmm. um, event uh, and also on TV. They've had a few. They've had a few. They've had done, done some post credits in the past, but I think it's really important that eight episodes into a nine episode show to put one post credit in there. <laughs> I think it was really funny, and I have to make sure that the two of us mentioned it as often as you can. Oh, talking about um about Easter eggs and stuff, John. Uh, the big DC event is going on at the moment, and um, the DC crossover stuff that's on on the CW. And do you know uh, what someone in Infinite Crisis, Infinite Crisis, yeah. yeah. Did you know what someone pointed out this week in the Flash? They have a moment where they're in uh, L.A. in Earth 666. Mm -hmm. Check it out if you're watching the event. There is a poster for Watchmen in a scene on the, on the Flash this week. So check that out. That is the first crossover of DC's Watchmen into the CW universe. So check it out. Interesting. <laughs> I never thought that was humanly, or dare I say it, Dr. Manhattanly possible. Well, they've had their big event this year with Dr. Manhattan versus Superman in the comic books, so this is the next step, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> Talk about chalk and cheese. Exactly. Thanks so much for that, Mike. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Mike. Also over on Facebook, Amy Fitzgerald Jura said, I just listened to your episode 8 podcast. I found the conversation surrounding the choice of Cal's body interesting. When I watched that scene, I felt that she originally kept Cal's body out of the choice because his whole story felt familiar to her. Angela possibly may have felt weird, not ashamed, but kind of icky because of a couple of personal, I'll bet, random connections. A black person is living in Vietnam with zero family and her grandma kind of died the same way. Just thought maybe she found the choice a little too on the money and didn't want to associate John with that. Just a thought. I could be wrong. You know, that's a really interesting point. Um, we were just wondering, because there were three other choices there, and then uh, she doesn't point out the fourth choice until John kind of opens up to her and says... I don't care. You choose, basically. Um, I still just wonder if there was some connection to it, but I think those are really good uh, guesses at the moment as to why. Absolutely. I, I think that's a really uh, nice kind of way to look at it uh, as well. And I mean, it, it's one of those things, will we ever really find out mm. why she didn't um, offer Kel's body initially as one of the three choices mm -hmm. uh, for Dr. Manhattan. I, I suspect that's not a question we're going to have answered, but as such, it's theorize away, fellow uh, watchers. And, and I think, Amy, this is a really nice kind of perspective on it, really, mm -hmm. that ultimately it felt too close to her own experience and, and, and didn't want... Um, for anything to happen. Maybe she even thought that Dr. Manhattan, by inhabiting this person's body, those kind of experiences and memories would come back to life. So it would almost be like reliving everything again through this person that she's going to spend the time with. Yeah, perhaps that was it. Yeah, I, I do also wonder, you know, that that moment where John says to her, I don't, I don't care about what body you choose. Well, he already knew which body she was going to choose because he's already been here. He's already experienced it. But he gives her the opportunity to say 
that there is another choice and gives her the opportunity to choose. You know, once again, didn't pressure her into, into choosing what he knew she was going to choose anyway. So that's why he didn't choose any of the other three bodies, because he knew there was another one on the way, I suppose. Uh, thanks so much for that, Amy. I was just doing some editing, and I had another thought about this feedback here from Amy. Um, one of the things that might be causing the reaction from Angela as to why she's kind of embarrassed to show Cal as her choice, I suppose. Uh, one of the things that just popped back into my head is that conversation that she had with her grandmother, where she effectively says the reason that she chose Sister Knight to represent her and the reason why she loves the character, even though she's never seen the film, is because it stands out to her and looks like her. It's a representative of her because she doesn't see that kind of representation around her at all. The basic criteria that she has here showing all the other bodies is it's someone that doesn't have a family, someone that will be sent off to uh, be cremated and effectively be ashes over Saigon. Um, Cal fits that piece, but also reminds her of her. Um, she's in a place where not many, many people look like her, exactly as June says. It must be really lonely for her. She's lived most of her life that way. So I think that's part of the reason, and it just didn't cross my mind when we were talking about it there, but uh, glad I'm able to jump back in. And again, great feedback from Amy. Yeah, Dave Horrock said, okay, the graffiti at the start had me in stitches. Uh, yes. I completely agree. Um, no, I, I felt like I was going back to high school, to be honest. Um, I was like, he, he. <laughs> Another bit of graffiti, if you didn't see it, a, a massive uh, penis drawn onto the uh, onto Dr. Manhattan on the wall, a uh, big red penis drawn on him. <laughs> well, absolutely. No wonder the Viet Cong kind of bowed down in the end or were <laughs> terrified of this huge thing coming towards I them. think it might have been that he was destroying them left, right and centre as well. Uh, interestingly, over on one of the fan groups, on the, over on, uh, on a Watchmen fan group on Facebook, they were having a discussion about, I know we get to see him naked, but why has he never got a hired member when he's naked? Surely at some point, Dr. Manhattan would have had that. I just think it's really funny that that's the speculation that some people have, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that was why one of Ozymandias' screens was cracked. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dave. Uh, Ray Felix says, here's a prediction. Angela Abar becomes the new Dr. Manhattan. The poster says it all. She's cast in a blue light. Also, when Manhattan tells her, I need you to see me walking on water over the pool, it's like he's training her or reminding her that when they met, he mentioned that he can walk on water. Lastly, Abar, the Black Superman, was a black exploitation movie, which Angela's Sister Knight character shared the same origins. Also, I think Looking Glass will be the new Rorschach. He killed off the Seventh Cavalry members and took one of their masks. He may be trying to clean up the name Rorschach by taking on the Seventh Cavalry. Ray, those are fantastic predictions. Absolutely. Really, I really love that one. If you have a chance to see the poster, um, the original poster for the show, Angela Barr, is cast in a blue light. It's right there. I saw somebody on Twitter talking about it the other day going, I cannot believe nobody mentioned that she's got a blue light on her, you know? So could Angela be the new Dr. Manhattan? He said in this episode he can transfer his powers to someone if he just gives some kind of organic material to them, infused with his powers, possibly he can he can transfer the power to her. And in fairness, he may have given her quite a lot of uh, organic material <laughs> in the closet. He probably did, he probably did, but he probably needs to know to infuse it with his powers, ah, yeah, yes. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, really good theories, uh, Ray, for sure. I think um, it, it, it's one of those things where you, you look at that first poster and you don't think anything of it. And then all of a sudden the events unfold and you go back, as you're saying, even on the episodes, you look at it again, it mm -hmm. takes on a potentially new meaning and, and a new significance. Um, I, I think certainly we um, could definitely see this idea of Angela Abar sort of trying to be um, this superhero um, on, on the basis of, of, of Sister Knight. Um, and yeah, I think um, with Looking Glass, I like the idea that you say that he's, you know, cleaning up the name of Rorschach because mm. ultimately Rorschach has been game for absolute anyone really and, and whatever way they maybe want to interpret his journal interpret him uh perceive him and it, it feels like um his message probably needs 
um, re-amplifying and, and cleaned up a little mm. and maybe Looking Glass is the person to do that for sure. No, I really like the theories there, uh, Ray. Thanks uh, so much for the, for those. Really good theories, Ray. Remember, again, the Rorschach of the comic book was based on the idea of Punisher and Batman, the idea of what if those people lived in real life, these uncompromising people, they would be a-holes just like Rorschach is. So uh, the idea of the Seville Cavalry taking on his bible effectively his diary uh, he did subscribe to that right wing magazine when he, in the in the 80s he did send it off to them for it to be published and they turned it into this manifesto effectively from Rorschach so uh, so he wasn't that great of a guy in the first place but i like the idea of looking glass becoming a new Rorschach someone that uh, will probably be better at t- spreading his message to other people i suppose yeah um thanks so much mm-hmm. uh richard blaze over on our facebook group also says okay i'm a little on the fence for this episode as i didn't fully buy into the look or sound of dr manhattan mm. i thought that billy crudup did such an amazing version of him in the uh, Zack snyder film i was disappointed that he didn't sound like him in the tv show uh, okay. also when it was cal dr manhattan i wasn't really convinced by the special effects so a bit of it misfired for me however on a complete flip though cal has a hell of a body when meeting with vite i genuinely couldn't blink and was just transfixed <laughs> it's kind of like that moment where you just watch the toing and throwing of a metronome above a piano <laughs> that's um, john saying this not richard <laughs> no no exactly yeah sorry this is me um I, I, similarly yes i was uh, transfixed by the body of, of Cal, uh, <laughs> and indeed, um, certain other elements. Yes, it, it was kind of like hypnotic, <laughs> uh, I, I suppose, in that sense. Richard Blazer continues with, I thought the story and how things were being wrapped up and revealed was nice and a tight thing to do with still only one episode left Mm -hmm. and could result in the last one purely focusing on the events of the attack with no need for any flashbacks. So for me, a real mixed set of emotions from watching uh, this week's episode. Thanks for that so much, Richard. Yeah, I, I really liked what Billy Crudup did in the movie. You know, remember, that's 10 years ago now. Um, it doesn't seem like it's because there's been a couple of extra cuts of the movie over the years, but it's almost 10 years ago since Billy Crudup was in that role. And um, they wanted to do something new with this character of Cal. And I think they really made the choice and just stuck with it. There is something that is interesting about watching it the second time when I watched it. Um Cal does move in and out of the two different versions of Dr. Manhattan. You see him with the white eyes and you see him with that that blue glow and he dulls it down and brings it back to Cal's body occasionally. So he is just kind of a blue Cal sometimes and other times he's Dr. Manhattan and that is totally purposeful. That isn't just special effects not working sometimes, you know. Um So I really like the idea that sometimes he's kind of flashing in and out of the two different sides of it. There's a reason for it, I suppose, in universe. It's not just because they can't afford the special effects of having his eyes white um, all the time and they can't have him floating all the time. Um, So I really do like that. And obviously, occasionally we do see the other version of Dr. Manhattan from behind or we see him um, out of focus in the background. There's a really good touch that somebody pointed out to me. Have a look uh, the next time you're watching the episode when Cal is lying on the couch reading a book in the television across the room you can see his face is blue uh, in there they've done a little touch of that as well oh ah, wow so i cool. i hadn't spotted that at all yeah no that that's that's awesome that's really cool isn't uh, it? yeah thank you so much uh, richard uh, for for the feedback mm-hmm. and i i think yeah i i think the flashback thing is really interesting because i think for me as well i i'm kind of taking these I suppose I'm going to put flashbacks in inverted commas. Yes. Um, it, it is that I'm actually just taking them as part of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think sometimes you could have an entire story in flashback. Yeah. So I, I, I don't really have that much of a problem, although I, I would definitely sort of lean back towards what was said previously about, you know, it's just a shame maybe that they do detract sometimes from, I think in particular, uh, Laurie Blake and Looking Glass and, and Agent PC. Um, I, I, I must say, I, I would like to see, um, them 
a, a little more uh, specifically agent pt's alter ego um <laughs> You know, although again, I at the time thought he would be a bigger player. I thought he was potentially Seventh Cavalry. Right. Um, he he seems a little kind of evil, a little <laughs> sort of too knowingly looking at um Agent Blake uh, back in the FBI mm. uh, building uh, right at the start of this series. So he's a, a historian. He's just fascinated by Agent Blake. That's yeah, all. exactly. But yeah, who knows. But we also got our final bit of Facebook feedback through from Cahill uh, Fitzgerald, mm-hmm. who says, A staggeringly good episode. I've never seen a Damon Lindelof show before, so I don't know where the nervousness about tying all the threads together comes from. Mm. It seems to me that the writing is being delivered and portrayed with scalpel-like precision when most shows use a spoon. Top class work and roll on the finale. Dare I say that they have raised a bar for an episode of TV. Very, very good, Carl. Although, <laughs> as you have said, you should go and get your coat. Um, for sure. Good point. I, good point. I think that's good. No, that is good. <laughs> if Damon Lindelof can do it on a primetime HBO show, well, then Carl Fitzgerald can do it as well. As can podcast. anyone. I, I, that's a good one. Absolutely. Raised a bar. If you have never seen a Damon Lindelof show, right. So the reason why people are nervous about it is actually probably <laughs> a little bit more from the movies that lost. he's done in the past. Um, not really Lost as much. Uh, lost had seven or six seasons of the show um, where they created this kind of mystery and this concept and this idea and everybody wanted to know what the mystery was. And the payoff wasn't what people were thinking. Um, Damon Lindelof specifically as a, as a writer tends to write a lot of good character studies, things about people and their relationships. And he's not great at nailing what the mystery is at the end, right? Uh, I would think in this show, we've probably already just got the reveal of the big mystery. Where's Dr. Manhattan? Yeah, because Dr. Manhattan was the godlike character in 1985. Whereas Dr. Manhattan, he's been in plain sight right from the first episode of the show. He's right there, mystery over, mystery solved. There's a next episode in the finale of the season to wrap up now. Uh, will he do a good job on that now that that mystery's out of the way? Um, do you think there's another bigger mystery to unve- unveil, John? Any ideas whether there's a bigger mystery that we will feel hard done by if it's not revealed in the ninth episode? I wouldn't have thought so. Yeah. Um, I think... Uh, now it's just wrapping up the story, which feels different for Damon Lindelof. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, um, uh, as I talked about before, The Leftovers is another fantastic show. Had three seasons of it. The first episode of the show, millions of people across the world disappear. Slight spoilers here, that's never actually addressed as a, and an answer is never given over the three seasons of the show as to why that happened as such. But it's a great character study of what happens to the world when millions of people disappear at one moment. Um, so I'd say definitely go check that out. Other people would say they were looking for the answer to that central question at the beginning and the show was a failure because it didn't answer that central question. But definitely not a failure for me. But I think that's just different people's opinions. You know, not every show is for everybody, as we've always said. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Cahill, for the for the feedback. Mm-hmm. We have got some other pieces of feedback that came in after we recorded our episode eight feedback episode, but because we have such a limited time, with only one more episode to go, I wanted to make sure I recorded it here and put it out during the feedback episode. First up over on our Facebook group, Ronaldo says, okay, watching episode eight now and will most likely be too late to make it on the feedback show, but I've just got to say, wow, this episode was a huge payoff for me and I found the writing and performances absolutely superb. The paradox of a bar telling her grandfather about Crawford was thoroughly satisfying. I hear a lot of Watchmen fans are up in arms at the treatment of the characters. Perhaps my view is skewed, as I am admittedly not a serious fan of the book. I enjoyed reading it back in the day, but I can't say I'm a mega fan. But the sheer quality of this show far outweighs the direction the showrunners have taken it. And anyway, isn't this no different from creators taking an established property, created by others, to tell a good story? Miller didn't create Batman, Bendis didn't create Daredevil. This is just another medium, expanding on a creation made by more. Anyway, I digress. All things said, I just want to reread the graphic novel now, and I'll be watching as soon as I can the season finale of this highly enthralling show. Looking forward to listening to your thoughts now on the latest episode. Thanks so much for your thoughts, Ray. Yeah, a really, really good episode. It's a really odd one, isn't it, when you say things like, lots of fans are up in arms about this. You know, I'm 42 years old, around the same age as yourself, Ray, I think. Um, I read this book when I was a kid, around the right age to to read it, I think, probably when I was about 13, I suppose, I read read the book, uh, maybe 14, somewhere around that. 
And I would absolutely consider my, myself a Watchman fan because I constantly recommend the book to other people. But what I'm certainly getting now, especially with the shows on TV, is there are a lot of other people that read that book and had a very different feeling or belief as to what happened at the end of the book or what happened to the characters. You know, I may have forgotten about something as massive as the squid, as I talked about early on in the season, but I certainly didn't forget a lot of the feelings that the book gave me and about the characters and the concepts of what they were representing, I suppose, in comic books. And I think Damon Lindelof has carried off what he wanted to say with this show in this universe really, really well, along with the rest of the writers. Um, so I'm not sure about this idea of a lot of fans up in arm about the treatment of the characters. I have seen the sadly usual vocal minority complaining about things because well that's the internet and they're going to complain about it regardless of what way it's done but overall the vast majority of reviewers the vast majority of watchers that i've seen for these episodes absolutely love the show unfortunately it was attacked when the show came out first because of the representation that was involved in the show and because some people who got Rorschach tattoos on their body are now wondering why their character has been turned into this role model for the 7th Cavalry, that kind of stuff. But overall, I think the actual reception of the show from fans and non-fans alike has been pretty high, which is great. In terms of them making the show at all, in terms of them using the characters, it just hasn't been done much before. And I think before Watchmen, the comic books um, that came out weren't very well received. They kind of told the story that had already been told and told them in a very plain and kind of flat way uh, there's the joke out there that actually American hero story in the show is kind of the comic books before Watchmen it's a kind of a slag on the idea that they would make comic books out of these really basic stories that are told in flashback within the Watchmen comic book that's the kind of joke that's in there so other than those these characters have never been really in other comic books you know we have Doomsday Clock going on at the moment where they're being brought into the DC world uh, but this was done concurrently with the writing of this show so I think people feel a little bit protect protective about you know taking a standalone one-off experience of the original comic books collected into that graphic novel and following it up without the involvement of one of the two creators. We have to note here that Dave Gibbons is the other creator of the book. Uh, Alan Moore is one of the creators, Dave Gibbons the other, and Dave Gibbons has been involved in the creation of this show right from the get-go. So uh, so one of the creators is involved in the show. Um, I kind of feel that a lot of the people that are complaining about it would have complained regardless of, of the involvement. There's always going to be somebody out there that doesn't like what's being put on screen, of course. But really good to hear your thoughts, Ray. As always, I'm glad you're enjoying the show as much as we are. Uh, hopefully you enjoy the final episode of the show coming up next Sunday. I also got an email in from Danielle LeBlanc. Uh, yesterday, just after we'd finished recording the podcast, always happens. Uh, Danielle says, the final Watchmen is coming up and I already miss this show. This past episode left me with so many questions about Dr. Manhattan and the nature of his omnipresence. When he speaks, he talks not only as if he were everywhere at once, but as if what is going to happen is inevitable. But for things to be inevitable, that would mean no one, even Dr. Manhattan, has free will. Instead, perhaps it's like multiple universes, as in the multiverse theory implicated by quantum mechanics. Dr. Manhattan can see past, present and future of not just one universe, but of multiple possible universes. And he at certain important decision points, he chooses which one he wants to make his reality. For example, at the moment, Dr. Manhattan stands looking at Angela after they finished fighting the cavalry members. He knows the Tachyon transporter gun is about to hit him with its beam. He told Angela that it would be while they were speaking in the kitchen. But in that moment of calm, when he was staring at Angela, he could have teleported Angela and himself away, or disintegrated the person operating the gun, or opened a hole under the truck holding the gun to swallow it up. So he did nothing, and allowed the beam to hit him because he wanted it to happen. That means that Dr. Manhattan also wants whatever happens afterwards to happen as well, and that he likely put this whole series of events in motion to get to this point. The question is, what is the point he's aiming at? If he ends up dying in the disintegration chamber, then that means he's embarking on a whole journey relationship with Angela with the intention of dying at the end. Whether or not he ends up surviving, I'm guessing Dr. Manhattan set this all in motion to either one, stop whatever Lady True is planning, or two, pass on his abilities to Angela. Ever since Lady True said that she uses cerebral fluid as the cure for nostalgia, I got the definite evil vibe from her. Kind of cruel and deadly to siphon off someone's human or elephant cerebral fluid. I don't think Hooded Justice is in on her plan. I definitely feel she is pulling a fast one like Adrian did, and so stopping Lady True and the cavalry, who Lady True might be manipulating or working with, could be Dr. Manhattan's purpose. 
Also, since the latest episode mentions that Dr. Manhattan could theoretically transfer his powers to another being, that might be a hint that he will transfer his powers to someone else, particularly Angela. In episode 8, Dr. Manhattan seems a bit weary. He tells Adrian that creating life was not satisfying, as he thought, and he abandons his adoring creations. And he regretted trying to live up to expectations and invading Vietnam. It seems to me that Adrian is right and Dr. Manhattan lacks imagination, and that Dr. Manhattan might have come to the realisation that this lack of imagination could be a deficit. I mean, he didn't have to go into Vietnam all action figure-like. He could have disappeared weapons or moved transported Viet Cong leadership to the paradise he created, or anything else that involved less killing. But it's like he limits himself to what is possible with the powers he has. Maybe he thinks someone else might make better use of his powers. Maybe all this is just a ploy to bring Angela mentally to a place where she both understands and would accept Dr. Manhattan's powers. I'm going to end my long, rambling, wild speculation now. I just finished watching episode 8 and it left me with so many questions about Dr. Manhattan. I'm enjoying your podcast on The Watchman. Looking forward to seeing how this all ends. Best, Danielle. Danielle, thank you so much for sending in the feedback. I do feel kind of like I'm cheating on the guys, uh, Chris and, and John, because I know they both have different opinions about what's going on in the show, and I get to share my own opinion, I suppose, on what you've said. Dr. Manhattan is not the kind of superhero that you think he is, is, is the way I would say it. In my reading of the comic books and of the series, uh, what we've seen so far of Dr. Manhattan, he's seeing everything happening from start to finish, all at exactly the same time. Everything from the beginning of his life to the end of his life, he's seeing it all at exactly the same time. So the inevitability or him setting plans in motion, it's more to get to the point that he knows it's going to be at, not to get to the point that he wants it to be at, because he doesn't have want or need. Um, there's actually a great description of this in the comic books where Dr. Manhattan says to Laurie, we're all just puppets, but I'm just a puppet who can see the strings. So he's still manipulated by the universe. He still has no control as such in the universe. Somebody else is controlling over all the universe, but he can see what's going on. He can see how he's being manipulated or how things are being manipulated in the world to get to their destination point. I hope that makes a bit more sense. They do try, they did try in the TV show. I can see from episode eight, they're trying to tell everybody that he can't stop things from happening by, you know, getting into that fight with Laurie and getting kicked out of the house. He knew that was going to happen. He could easily not have gotten into that fight. He could have stopped talking if he wanted to stop or wanted to have a perfect life where nothing bad ever happens. But as I said earlier on in the podcast, he's omniscient, not omnipotent. He's able to see everything, but can't do everything. He's not got unlimited power. There is a limit to what he can do. And it seems like the, the limit that he has is that he can't change the actual future. Um, there is just one timeline, according to what's been laid out in the comic book and in the show. There's just one timeline. It's not, a, it's not the Doctor Strange multiple, uh, possibilities of the world, multiple possibilities of the universe. That's not what he's seeing. He's seeing what actually happens to him across these futures. Uh, what we saw about the Tachyon thing in the comic books, having Tachyon rays blocked his vision of what was going on at that particular time. And what we see um, throughout the show here, this this tunnel of love that they talk about in episode eight, uh, that 10 year period, Dr. Manhattan can't see anything that goes on within those 10 years because his powers have been um, blocked effectively. So he hasn't seen what went on to him in those 10 years. He was able to piece it together from uh, some of the memories of Cal uh, in his head. And he pieced it all together before getting to that point where he knew he was going to be taken by the 7th Cavalry um, to fulfill the next step effectively. I do really like the theory that th that he's going to transfer his powers to Angela. There's some very specific things that are said within the show, and I absolutely don't think they would have said, I could transfer my powers into an organic material, which whoever consumed it could get my powers. They absolutely wouldn't have put that in as a line in the show if they weren't intending to do something with it. And again, that line where he's standing on top of the pool um, saying, you need to see this, this is important to, for later to Angela, does spark the idea that he is going to transfer his powers to Angela or and he knows he's going to because he's already seen that in the future as well. We're going to see that in just a few days time when we get it to the next episode. But thanks so much for that feedback, Amy. We'll go back to the end of our podcast and the table quiz. Thanks, everybody, for the feedback. Now on to the regular discussion about PC. You wanted more PC. There's always more PC every single week over at HBO.com slash PCpedia, John. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, these kind of went over my head, I think, okay. these two documents. Um, maybe it was because I was in from work and it was just... I was just finding it difficult to follow mm. um, to some extent, at least the stuff around the Fog Dancer. Which is um, basically all of it. No, it is, but I mean the actual clipping. Uh -huh. um, 
you know, the the memo, okay, that's good um, for sure. So I think I will take the memo. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there is the memo um, on Fog Dancing uh, by Agent PC as he talks about this famous book by Mac Shea. Mm. Um, so, you know, we've seen a lot of characters and references to this book. So, for example, in Episode 8, we have seen... Um, Adrian Veidt in his cell reading the book. That's right. And um, so it's there a lot through this series of, of Watchmen as yeah, well. And we saw the family, the Clarks, who got the land bought, bought off them by uh, Lady True. Uh, the, the wife of the family was reading that. Um, we've seen a number of versions of the film in it. So it's always been a slightly important book. It's written by the author who wrote The Black Freighter in the comic books, um, just as a reference, just as a reference point for anybody who has read the comic books. We've mentioned that a few times, but it's so intricate, I suppose, this background piece is being brought to the foreground by Agent PT and Pedia this week. Yeah, and I, I think first off, with the memo as well, mm. um, you know, there's some potential spoilers here, um, because whilst we don't know what, who... Uh, he's specifically talking about yeah. he he does talk about at least two unidentified people who have been killed from events that have happened in Tulsa mm-hmm. and we're kind of thinking that's events that have happened in episode 9 of of Watchmen so um agent PC thinks he may know who they are as as t- uh, as these two people mm-hmm. uh, who are missing, but ultimately it could be anyone, but certainly the people that he is, he, he knows it, it well is known to him, yeah. you know? Um, I think the other thing is that, you know, secondly in this, in this memo, you, you get the background from agent PC about fog dancing and, and, and it's author without really ever mentioning the the comic within the Watchmen comics, uh, Tales from the Black Freighter. So, mm-hmm. you know, but what he does is he provides context for um, the feeling of the book as being similar to uh, movies such as Jacob's Ladder and Shutter Island. Mm. Um, and I think the important thing of this and kind of what Asian... PC is kind of alluding to here is that, you know, these movies are stories that have unreliable narrators mm-hmm. at the heart of them. Yeah. And, and we've seen, you know, certainly what well, episode two, episode three, all of a sudden, um, Angela Abar is being cast in that, um, unreliable narrator role because of the introduction of agent Blake, who is investigating as an FBI agent. Um, and certainly, um, I suppose with the revelation in this episode, she has been hiding a hugely, f- uh, phenomenal secret, not just from agent Laurie mm-hmm. or her, her friends and colleagues in the Tulsa PD, but the world, you know, this is someone immediately divisive in, in, in Dr. Manhattan. So, um, you know, she has been keeping things under wraps for 10 um, years. For yeah. 10 years. Yeah. Agent PC mentions that many people have read the book and, um, and it includes a lot of the people from the Minutemen, including Mothman, who read it obsessively. Also, Adrian Veidt, who, who called, um, it the second best book ever written. Mm-hmm. You know, his ego getting him, uh, getting in the way there, uh, obviously not wanting to put his own book into second place. Mm-hmm. Dr. Manhattan has quoted it and, Rorschach and the comedian also had copies. Uh, Detective Tillman, who is Looking Glass, also read this book uh, repeatedly. So um, there are a number of people uh, who ha- have read this. I think, you know, PT also confirms that the author, Max Shea, has disappeared in the mid 80s uh, and, and references Rorschach's journal um, from the original comics that he also uh, disappeared after creating the hoax with the huge squid in New York. So uh, maybe this idea that he's been bumped off. Um, also uh, confirming that both the Seventh Cavalry and uh, the the Nixon Ford regime claim fog dancing as their own. So mm. it's claimed by a lot of people here, including people with uh, masks. Um, and you know, finally saying that he's given in. He, he's going to give American Hero story another go. As, as while they may not have been historically accurate, they are 
another opinion. So it's interesting to see Agent PT's kind of change here mm -hmm. um, and about turn on his views of American Hero Story. Maybe in this instance, he is thinking that different perspectives may add to his knowledge of superheroes and masked vigilantes and the research that he does. Yeah. And so has to give American Hero Story um, a... A, a second reading or a second watching, I should say. Yeah, yeah. And, and another example here with fog dancing, another Rorschach test really for the American people. You know, um, this is effectively saying that everybody's read it. Tons and tons of masked vigilantes have read it. They all had their opinion on it. He constantly referenced that he had his own opinion on it, which is the other clipping that we're going to talk about. But everybody has their belief of what they read in fog dancing and what they believe the book was about effectively. It's one of these, one of those kind of books that that everybody has an opinion on, which just like a Rorschach test, what do you see in this picture? What does it speak to you? Um, that's fog dancing. So and I like the connection there of what they've created here uh, within this this idea. And I think also you had a really interesting theory, which I think you'll now come on to with the clipping uh, for, uh, which comes from the magazine all about Max Shea mm -hmm. uh, and Nothing Ever Ends. Yes, yes. The magazine is, is called Nothing Ever Ends. It was an article in December 2005, which is 14 years ago. And if you look at Agent PT, he's probably late 20s. Yeah. So we're probably talking about something that he wrote when he was in his teenage years uh, for this magazine that he obsessed over, basically. But it was Dale Peaty's submission to a competition to provide a kind of a synopsis or a cut-down version, the Cliff Notes version of Fog Dancing. Um, so what a great idea, a great way to get across what actually fog dancing is about in this universe right look at you giving away your age with cliff notes <laughs> i never use them that's something that i've just seen in american movies quite a lot so <laughs> um there is a character in here that sounds very like lube man it seems that all of the fog dancers themselves this main character in the book they're like navy seals but they're described as wearing gas mask skin tight silver suit shimmering with SPF 666, looking slick and doing what must be done in secret. So is Petey running around in the silver suit? We had speculated almost immediately that Petey had a similar build uh, to the Lube Man character. So is he running around in the suit because of the Fog Dancers that he read about in Fog Dancing? I mean, it it, it is conceivable. It's yeah, It's pretty likely. <laughs> pretty likely and conceivable for sure. And one other thing that I noticed that was kind of notable about the write-up uh, itself there's a flip in the character perspective. It starts out where PT speaks about the characters in the book and gives all of their character background. And then towards the end, it says, you wake up in the hospital. Yeah. So it suddenly seems to go to first person or at least third person where he's talking at you from the beginning. He's talking about the characters in the book and then it just flips. I'm wondering if the book itself of fog dancing is an example of mesmerism like we saw in that book Mesmerism for the Masses back in episode six, this idea that you can control people's minds by doing certain tricks and doing certain things. Is fog dancing an example of mesmerism? Since so many masked vigilantes are talked about as having read it, have they been mesmerized into putting on the masks by this book? I think that sounds like a really good theory, to be honest. I Isn't think it? this idea of being mesmerized into doing something and certainly mm. were, you know, you are flipping the perspective of the, the written text to you wake up in the hospital. You know, it, it, it's almost that idea of certainly as you're reading, it's repeating again and again and mm -hmm. again. And if that sentence crops up again and again and again, then it, it you begin to take effect. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's like a, a, a doctor asking you to repeat after them to kind of embed that into your mind and mm -hmm. um, that reinforcing of the action. Uh, so yeah, no, that, that, that's a really interesting spot there on, so, on the different perspectives of the, the narrative mm -hmm. uh, in, in the cliff notes version, as we'll call it uh, <laughs> of the, the fog dance. What's the UK version of that John? UK version of cliff notes. Is there any other version? 
probably just Cliff Notes. Right, okay, um, so it was right. <laughs> but, I mean, I've never used Cliff Notes. Oh, of course not, of course not. <laughs> I wouldn't know what those things are. I'm far too young. <laughs> uh, me too. Uh, I'm one year older than you. <laughs> um, so, obviously, the big question, as I say, is has Agent Petey, like so many others, been pushed towards donning a mask and fighting and going out fighting for justice? So, I wonder, in part of the Rorschach test that is fog dancing, are certain people attracted to the book and then go out and don the mask, you know, because there are definitely some books in the past that have been connected with serial killers, for example, they've been found in certain locations. So I'm wondering if this is the connection that they're trying to make here. Uh, but some really interesting stuff in there. If you're interested in getting even more detail about the show, definitely PTPD is the way to go. Uh, HBO.com slash PTPD. I think we've solved who Lube Man is. Maybe PT would be very, very annoyed that it turned out to be Lube Man and not Fog Dancer, as he probably wanted to be called. <laughs> Now, let's get on to everybody's favourite part of the episode, our Watchmen pub quiz. Do you have the question for episode 8, John? I do, yes. Episode 8 pub quiz for the Watchmen pub quiz. The only an official Watchmen pub quiz, <laughs> uh, dare I say it. Um, also and, the only unofficial pub quiz. And the, pub the quiz. only unofficial one, and of course the only yes. Watchmen pub quiz actually happening at this moment in time mm -hmm. um at least on a podcast it may be in an actual pub yes. rather than a virtual pub like we're here like we're trying to replicate here but certainly yes pour your favorite drink uh pull up a a soft sort of loungy type um chair get your pen and paper ready uh to answer the, the following question. Uh, remember, send in your answers to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com and we will be having our live draw for the uh, winner and the point score on our episode nine feedback episode mm -hmm. uh, of, of Watchmen. The final episode nine pub quiz question will be done actually on our discussion podcast of the episode itself mm -hmm. so here we go episode eight what does dr manhattan bring to the table the first time he meets angela abar in episode eight of the hbo watchman series <laughs> i think that is a very pertinent um question for this pub quiz i do like that will we accept knowledge of the past present and future Absolutely. <laughs> have I just given away the answer, though? Well, I I have... <laughs> the answer is within a particular time zone, so okay. to speak, okay. of, of either the past, present, or future. But I think we can accept uh, <laughs> answers across all uh, times, uh, as Dr. Manhattan does uh, live them all at the same time. I have seen the answer. I think you're talking about more of a basic <laughs> answer for this one, a more of a definitive Absolutely. answer. Right? Yes, it, it's very definitive. <laughs> the first time, yes. Excellent, excellent. Thanks so much, as always, for the pub quiz question, John. Hopefully, we'll get loads more answers in for the pub quiz before the show ends. We'll be back next week at some point with our chat about episode nine of Watchmen. See how they fly. John, would you like to read the synopsis? Sure. Everything ends for real this time. Dun, dun, dun. So a big, big statement there, because remember, Dr. Manhattan did have that phrase to Adrian Weiss. Nothing ever ends. Yeah, so this time it will end. Uh, do you want to point out that Damon Lindelof was in conversation this week about his time on Watchmen and did say, if there is a Watchmen season two, he'll happily watch it but it will be with different creators. Ooh, interesting. Mm. I'm not too sure whether I want to watch A Watchman without Damon Lindelof, to be honest. Well, we could have said we wouldn't want to see A Watchman thing without Alan Moore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we are doing. Um, so, no, I think everyone has their thing to bring to the table. If they have the right idea, the um, right concept. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even Zack Snyder, like, trying to be, you know, literally faithful mm -hmm. to... Maybe a fault, arguably, to the the comic panels mm -hmm. um, of Alan Moore's uh, and Dave Gibbons's, um, you know, twelve issues. Yep. When putting it into a, a different art form, yep. as Alan Moore would always say, 
he's a comic book writer, not a screenplay writer mm-hmm. or a film director or a TV writer or a TV showrunner mm-hmm. slash director. Or, you know, so I mean, it's just interesting, isn't it? But uh, certainly, if it's the right thing, absolutely. Yeah. And if it's the wrong thing, well, then unfortunately, we may know quite early on in the first episode, <laughs> and we still will have to do another eight episodes. There you go. There you go. <laughs> but until next time, fellow watchers, thanks so much for listening, and uh, keep watching The Watchmen. Yeah, absolutely, fellow watchers. It's a pleasure, as always, speaking with you. Uh, we'll be back next time. Remember, fellow watchers, keep watching, keep listening. Bye. Bye.